Hello, everyone. How are you? I hope you're doing great. My name is Diego Plaza. I'm a Chilean lawyer. I'm an animal law LLM from Lewis and Clark Law School and also the executive director of the Center for Chilean Animal Studies, CIDA Chile. I'm delighted to be here with all of you sharing these interesting views on aquatic non-human animals, aquatic environments, and also human animals as well. But I'm kind of sad that I wasn't able to be there with you, at least not in person, but connected at the same time to this activity. The truth is that the time difference between Chile and Kazakhstan is huge, so I wasn't able to be there on time. So I'm pre-recording this session, and I hope it will be interesting for every one of you. So I will be sharing my screen, my presentation, so we can start. OK, so we will be talking about this morning in Kazakhstan about the environmental, some environmental problems in the exploitation of aquatic animals and fluvial watercourses in Chile. Chile is considered as one of the leaders or the leading countries in South America in the region. So I think it may be interesting to analyze some issues we face regarding these topics in my country. So we will be able to have a sort of picture of these issues in South America. Sounds right? So we'll be talking about the fishery situation, after that about the aquaculture situation, and after that about the production of hydroelectric power in Southern Chile. So regarding fisheries, I will start talking about the dynamics known as the capture of the state by economic power groups or corporate colonization of politics. Theories that show us how the wealthy minorities of societies, currently called super rich, manipulate representatives of political authority at their convenience. In Chile, an emblematic case exemplifying this process occurred with the fitting law and the bribes made by different industrial groups to various politicians, as has happened with the Northern Fishing Corporation Corpesca, the Association of Fishing Industrialists, ACIPES, and the company Friosur, among others. Basically, these industrial groups bribed several congressmen to the extent of sending them emails with express instructions on how to vote in the Congress regarding this law and on how to answer interviews. And the outcome of this huge fiasco and scandal in Chilean politics was the creation of the Ley Longueira, or the Longueira Law, or <laughs> the Fitting and Agriculture Law but is known as the Longueira Law after the name of the Minister of Economy of, the, of that time, Mr. Pablo Longueira, who promoted this rule imposing adverse changes for the economy, the environment, and for non-human animals. We could talk the whole morning about the issues that we can find in this law, but I will talk really briefly about some of them. For example, this law established more restrictions for small fishermen than for large industry preventing smaller vessels from fitting in another region, unlike what happens with large fitting vessels. This law also established that large industries pay only for the licenses of their fitting fleet and not for the volume fished, which means that artisanal fishermen can pay the same or even more than companies. This law also forces artisanal fishermen to share their fishing grounds with industrial fishermen and does not include the recommendations to extend the five mile exclusion zone for fishing vessels, reduce, reducing the catching area for small vessels to just one mile and giving the first five miles, which are extremely rich in, in aquatic animals and other resources for industrial fishing devastating the country's marine ecosystems. And maybe one of the most interesting issues of this law is that it formally established fishing rights of large industry granted in perpetuity. This changed in the few years uh, after uh, the creation of this law, but uh, currently this law grants fishing rights in constitution for 20 years under the pretext of being able to ensure the investment. 
The outcome of this system was that the distribution of fishing quotas finally benefited seven super rich families. And these families recently merged into three large conglomerates controlling the 76% of the country's industrial fishing capacity, sharing profits calculated in at least $3 billion per year from the free extractions and exploitation of Chilean marine resources. So in this image, you can see the name Chilean Sea uh, next to Chile in 2012. But in 2013, after the Longueira Law, you can see the Angelini Sea, the Santa Cruz Sea, the Stengel Sea, the Izquierdo Sea, and the seas named after the names of the families owning uh, the fishing rights over those areas. According to some official data, particularly according to a state of the situation of the main Chilean fisheries, the uh, of the undersecretary of fisheries, one of the main administrations in, in my country in the area, the establishment of this system resulted in the intensification of the station of Chilean fisheries and marine ecosystems. So in the graphic, in your left, you will be able to see a gradual decrease in landings caused by the rule abrupt decrease in marine biomass and due to a prolongation of the critical state of overexploitation of various hydrobiological resources, which is all exacerbated, determined and boosted up basically by the fishing methods commonly used for industrial purposes, such as the well-known bottom trolling, which has been questioned for a long time due to its interaction with the seabed and the impact it generates on marine communities and ecosystems. Fortunately, during the year 2020, a bill was introduced declaring the Longueira law as undeniably null and void, which was pretty groundbreaking for Chilean politics. This based on the idea that the constitutional principle of probity was violated in the parliamentary discussion process, since parliamentarians who had at that time economic interests in the fishing industry were involved in its elaboration without them noticing it or even less disqualifying this themselves from voting. Today, the bill that annuls the law is in its first constitutional procedure and has been already been approved by the Chamber of Deputies in Chile. Although there are still several steps left in its approval process, in my opinion, this may represent certainly a, a glimmer of hope that will eventually allow us to reduce the degree of exploitation that we currently exert on the environment and on billions of non-human animals. Is this a happy ending? We don't know yet. We will see in the next few months. So, on the other hand, regarding agriculture, agriculture is a really an extremely large industry in Chile. But Chilean aquaculture uh, was almost non-existent in the 70s. Uh, however, it reached an extraordinary development during the 90s, uh, exceeding uh, 400,000 tons per year at the end of the decade. And in this regard, many voices have said that the spectacular growth of salmon aquaculture was responsible for the record growth rates shown by the Chilean aquaculture sector until the end of the 20th century. Nowadays, and according to a most recent World Bank data, Chile ranks 11th in aquaculture production in the world, and today is the second largest salmon producer after Norway. And basically, salmon, uh, which is the, the, the main product of this industry, is sold all over the world. The law that regulates this industry is the Fisheries and Aquaculture Law, or Longueira Law. And I think it's in, important to focus on two aspects regarding this law, the environment and the animal welfare. According to the Chile's Third Environmental Court of Valdivia, the Longueira Law has an essential environmental orientation. In this sense, in a ruling on a claim filed by the salmon farming company Seafood, the Environmental Third Court of Valdivia point out that it is inferred from the Longueira law that its rules 
are completely oriented to the conservation and sustainable use of marine resources and ecosystems. This may look great from an environmental point of view, but the truth is that regarding non-human animals, if we're talking about the sustainable use of marine resources, we're considering animals as things, not as subjects, and we're like normalizing the exploitation of these animals uh, through the legislature and the judiciary. On the other hand, regarding um, animal welfare, its Article 13F states that agriculture shall provide for rules that protect animal welfare and procedures that avoid unnecessary suffering. This may seem as a sort of an avant-garde rule uh, compared to other legal systems, but the truth, it, it has many shortcomings. For example, we're talking about providing for rules protecting animal welfare. It's difficult to determine uh, who has the duty, who's the subject that has the duty um, of providing for these rules. It seems that it should be uh, the agencies, uh, the administrations, or maybe the legislature, but it's really difficult to make the state, for example, uh, to comply with this rule of providing for animal welfare rules. On the other hand, the concept of unnecessary suffering is pretty problematic as well. If we are talking about unnecessary suffering, we are also talking about necessary suffering. Uh, see, but we should uh, prohibit all kinds of suffering, right? So if we are talking about uh, some sort of suffering that uh, it will be necessary and other that it will be unnecessary, we have to we have the duty to interpret what kind of suffering are we talking about. In order to to interpret this, we we have to interpret the Article 13F in the context of the law. This is a law that is intended to regulate the industrial exploitation of aquatic animals in order to satisfy human needs. So maybe under the context of this idea of this vision, many, many kinds of suffering will be considered necessary, which is extremely problematic. However, the sort of legal poetry contrasts with reality. Reality, the reality is that we have many issues to solve in Chilean aquaculture. For example, the current capacity and the fish biomass. Historically, in Chile, very few assessments of current capacity at cage, farm, or fjord scales have been conducted. In this regard, there is an increasing need for a sound productive current capacity estimation tool in order to establish the maximum number of volume of animals that can be supported by a specific area without causing unacceptable changes to ecosystems. Moreover, these really few assessments have been used neither by the government nor by the private sector to limit maximum fish biomass per area or water body. In this sense, determining the acceptable fish biomass per area is not only important for addressing the current capacity of Patagonian ecosystems to receive antibiotics and pesticides, but also for establishing a basic regulation to prevent overcrowding conditions inside cages. Another huge problem in Chile is the use of antibiotics. Why? Because in Chile there are no limits for the use of antibiotics in the control of fish diseases. And the only existing controls in this regard review the presence of antibiotics residues only in the final product, in marketable fish, but not in the aquatic environment intervened by this activity. Purely this data into perspective, according to an Oceana report from 2018, Chilean salmon farmers are using up to 950 grams of antibiotics to raise one ton of fish, while on the other hand, for example, Norway uses just 0.17 grams per ton of salmon. So we are talking about 0.17 grams against almost a kilogram. So the disproportionate use of antibiotics on salmon which was in Chile almost 1,500 more in 2014 than Norway. It's not only a threat for fish, but also for human health. In this sense, there is evidence that the use of high quantities of antibiotics has allowed development of antibiotic resistant bacteria and sediments. And there is also concern that salmon agriculture has the potential to increase the proportion of antimicrobial resistant bacteria to antibiotics that are currently being used in human medicine. 
And well, the other huge problem uh, for animal welfare in 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 Chilean agriculture is the skip of salmon. A skip of salmon from farms in Chile can have several ecological consequences of native biota and ecosystems. So it's considered one of the key environmental threats associated with salmon aquaculture. Many factors can produce these escapes from salmon crops. Among them, for example, damage to net pens from storms, tides, currents, predators, vandalisms, boats and farming equipment, eh, accidents, spill of pitch during transport, among others. And these escapes can produce an impact of, on native species through predation, competition, and spreading of disease and parasites, among others. We have to take into account that uh, salmon are an invasive and exotic species in Chile. They were introduced uh, for uh, a sport, for, for fitting, for, for, yeah, for fitting. Uh, that's another story. <laughs> another awful story. Uh, regarding the intervention of ecosystems in my country. However, um, according to some estimates, more than 900,000 salmon individuals escape annually from salmon farms. However, according to, to Greenpeace, about uh, the same amount of it, 900 salmon, uh, 900,000 of salmon, sorry, escaped from a marine harvest crop uh, during a storm in only one day in 2018. So um, we are not uh, really sure about the data, although it may seem a lot <laughs> compared to, for example, uh, I, I will give you an interesting example. So back to Greenpeace. Greenpeace exposed the case uh, of a escape uh, of less than 200,000 salmon from a Cook aquaculture farm in the United States in 2018 in Washington, precisely, which resulted in the decision by the state of Washington to end salmon activities from the year 2025, due to a serious environmental consequences that the activity had uh, in extensive sea areas of the state. However, in Chile, the Serna Pesca, regarding the escape of almost a million salmon in 2018, uh, called uh, the people not to consume wild salmon due to a high levels of antibiotics. That was the response of the agency. However, we have many other problems such as, the, for example, calius, the infectious salmon anemia, the eutrophication of coastal and marine environments, the interaction between, between uh, crops, aquaculture crops and wild animals, the fish and fish fed, and among many others. We don't have enough time to, to talk about them all, but I guess by now we should have a picture uh, of the magnitude of these issues in South America. And finally, I will talk a couple of minutes about the production of hydroelectric power in Chile. In Chile, hydropower is an important energy source for the country's operation. This energy is obtained by intervening in water courses and can take different forms, such as dam power plants, runoff river power plants, and even pump storage plants. In order to appreciate the relevance of this energy source, we must take into consideration that the Chilean electricity market is composed of three independent systems, two of which are fed by hydraulic energy. So regarding the National Electric System, the SEN, 27% of its installed capacity corresponds to hydraulic energy. On the other hand, concerning the ISEN system, the, the SEA, 37% of its installed capacity is generated by hydroelectric sources. In short, in Chile, there are more than 60 hydroelectric plants located in different areas of the country, forming an important part of the national power matrix. Uh, buildings or facilities that intervene in uh, fluvial water courses, which are the habitats of several uh, aquatic animal species. Despite uh, the above, and despite uh, that many people said that uh, hydroelectric power is a sort of green energy source, since uh, it's, it, the low impact it, it supposedly has, 
on the ecosystems and aquatic animals. The truth is that hydropower production in Chile has caused uh, several adverse effects on ecosystems and on non-human animals. The most significant deterioration occurs during the construction phase, not only uh, because it occupies the site where the plant itself will be located, but also because it invades a much larger territory. This due to the fact that temporary constructions are required. During this stage, the air is polluted, uh, heavy machinery produces a lot of noise, and the vegetation is cleared, destroying the habitat of numerous species and ecosystems. A task that can last for years in large plants and up to one year in the, in the case of smaller ones. Regarding uh, dam power plants, uh, one of the most usual kind of uh, hydroelectric plants in Chile, the impact is even bigger and due to a deterioration of the landscape and externalities affecting the population living in the flooding area. Similarly, ecosystems, archaeological sites, and heritage sites are affected. And moreover, recent studies have found that the rotting vegetation in the water indicates that dams are responsible for the emission of almost 1 billion tons of greenhouse gases each year, which is the equivalent to 1.3% of the world's annual human-generated emissions. Besides the above, one of the most conflictive situations is the loss of flora and fauna affected during the filling of the reservoir, including small mammals, reptiles, insects, and native flora, some of which are in a fragile state of conservation. It's important to note also that the individual interests of these non-human individuals are not considered in the decision-making process that precedes the installation of these structures beyond the consideration of those requirements arising from the so-called sustainable development mantra. Um, it's also important to notice that we have still several issues related to this uh, area that we have not solved in Chile. For example, uh, what happens to a fit that used to live in the watercourse on which the reservoir is being built? For the moment, there is no consensus or proof of effectiveness at the local level regarding the so-called fit ladders, the usual solution for this problem. In fact, it has even been warned that installing fit ladders without biological criteria or specific analysis of critical habitats and local population dynamics, among others, may end up compromising the conservation of fish fauna, becoming an ecological trap instead of a solution. Fortunately, civic mobilization and animal and environmental activism have managed to stop some projects that would have had irreversible impacts on animal dignity and environment. One of them, and maybe the perfect example of animal activism and environmental activism, was, was the case of the Idre Sem project, which finally did not prosper thanks to a lengthy legal and media battle, which led to its cancellation in 2017. The project formerly contemplated the construction and operation of five hydroelectric power plants, two on the Baker River and three on the Pascua River, this in the Aysin region in southern Chile. And this project would have flooded almost 600 hectares of natural reserves, would have affected six national parks, 11, 11 national uh, reserves, 26 priority conservation sites, 16 wetlands and 32 private protected areas. Besides, six Mapuche communities would have been affected. Mapuches are one of the originary people still living in southern Chile, uh, which fought uh, the European colonizers for more than 600 years. So uh, this was a happy ending, at least regarding this project. And I, I, I just wanted to finish my presentation by remarking how important it is to engage with animal activism and environmental activism. We may think that maybe our individual actions and efforts may not cause any changes in society, but the truth is that if we stay together and we collaborate, we can achieve uh, big things for non-human animals, for the environment, and for human animals as well. 
So thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, and I hope you can visit us on our website, ciachile.com, ciachile.cl. If you want to reach us out, we will be happy to talk with you, to collaborate with you, and to share more interesting views regarding non-human animals. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you have any questions, you can email me at diego.cidachile at gmail.com. And yes, I hope you, you will enjoy this beautiful morning uh, loaded with really interesting presentations. I hope you have a really nice day and I see you the next time. Bye.